disruptors and curious minds, CEOs, founders, book lovers. Welcome to the Thinking on Paper book club, where we read books that will change your mind, books that have stood the test of time, books like Don Norman's The Design of Everyday Things, Shane Parrish's Clear Thinking, Julio Tino's Nexus, and this week's book, month's book, three months book, <laughs> Quantum Supremacy by Michio Kaku. Yeah, we are the rebellion to the 15 minute book summary. We are the antithesis of the read a hundred books in a year, forget everything, learn nothing. One book, one chapter, one week. And since ancient times, people worshiped the sun as the harbinger of life, hope, and prosperity. The Greeks believed that Helios, the sun god, proudly rose across the sky in his blazing chariot, illuminating the world and giving warmth and comfort to the mortals below. That's us. But more recently, scientists have tried to capture the secret of the sun and bring its limitless energy down to earth. The leading candidate for this is called fusion, which some say is like putting the sun in a bottle. Jeremy, over to you. Got a question for you, Mark. Can fusion beat global warming in a race? Can fusion beat global warming in a race? Can the race to harness fusion as a viable alternative beat the race to where global warming wrecks everything. That was a question in the in one, in one of the chapters. I was like, that's really kind of an interesting thing to think about. It's a very good question. My money is, because I'm an optimist, I'm going on fusion. <laughs> yeah, I think the, the jury's still out, but it really interesting. So yeah, losing that race is not an option. It's not an option. It's not an option. We're done if, the ra if they lose. So fusion, come on. Like, let's get after this thing. Uh, so again, some of these chapters where I think we can go through these pretty quickly, um, just in, in a relation of, it, it follows a similar cadence to the previous chapters of like, Hey, here are some of the things that we think quantum quantum can help solve. Right? So how does the sun get its energy? It fuses hydrogen nuclei to form helium, right? That's the core of like the sun's secret. And as we'll find nature wins again, right? Nature wins again. And we're trying to follow nature and try to do the awesome things nature's doing. You have fusion and you have fission, right? So fusion is coming together of things like fusing of these nuclei and fission is trying to split them apart, right? A um, couple of things I took out of this just in the fusion versus fission um, is, you know, the, 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 uh, the waste product of fission is kind of gnarly, right? The waste product of fusion is commercially valuable, this helium gas, right? You have an accident in fusion you know, the process just stops. Nothing really happens. You have an accident in fission, gets pretty catastrophic. Um, so where I got with all of this, if we just want to fast forward and, and, you know, kind of, kind of get through some of, there's some, there's some cool examples and things in here, uh, some deep dives into scientific stuff, but the, the challenge is like the magnetic field required during the fusion process to hold the plasma stable enough for fusion to happen. Th that's really the problem that we're trying to solve. And it's going, it's a slow go right now because it's super complex. The equations for the magnetic field are figured out and known. The equations for the plasma uh, side of the fence are known, but the interactions are so complex that traditional computing can't help. Guess what? It's time for quantum. It's time for quantum. That's what I took out of this is like, and it's a theme. Like it helps the, help us figure out the interaction between these really complex things working together, interdependent, that sort of thing. Where, where, how do you feel about that? I think you've covered all the bases there. Yeah. Um, the <laughs> magnetic fields, quantum theory of superconductivity. You've covered it well. Um, just on the book itself, there's some nice explanations of how stars actually work, which was Ooh, nice yeah. for me to get around. It was, it was some nice... Um, explanations which were quite easy to visualize um, i like the way that michio kaku at one point says hold on let me quote um it's it's basically it's really easy to make stars <laughs> it's, 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 like the formula <laughs> of it, it 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 is kind of easy but the 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 power needed that not the power but the you got to heat this stuff up to like millions upon millions of degrees to where it turns not into gas, it turns into plasma, which is gas without electrons. Like, holy crap. Like, um, but hey, check this out. So Europeans versus Americans, right? So ITER, I think that one's in the States, right? 
The... Okay, let, let's just back up on that then, because I wanted to... So you spoke about the plasma and you spoke about the electromagnetic field and magnets. It's all about magnets. But modern... Oh, there are fusion reactors. People have tried to do this and it all kind of is built around what they call a tokamak. And if you're watching this, I'm showing an image of a tokamak, which all of these systems are based around. Which it kind of looks like a donut. Like, looks like a donut. It, yeah, exactly. It looks like a donut. And I just want to read this. It's quite a long segment. Um, this is where my thoughts went with this. So this is a tokamak. This is how you... Create, make a fusion reactor and this is the process to make pencils it. ready kids pencils ready the most popular design is a tokamak a russian design start with the cylinder and then wind wire coils completely around it take the two ends of the cylinder and connect them together forming a donut inject hydrogen gas into the donut and then shoot an electric current through the cylinder which heats up the gas to enormous temperatures to contain this hot plasma, huge amounts of electrical energy are fed into the coils that surround the donut, thereby containing the plasma with a powerful magnetic field and preventing the plasma from hitting the walls of the reactor. Finally, once fusion starts, hydrogen nuclei combine to form helium, releasing vast amounts of energy. In one design, two isotopes of hydrogen, deuterium and tritium are fused together, creating energy, helium, and a neutron. This neutron, in turn, carries the energy of fusion outside the reactor where it hits a blanket of material surrounding the tokamak. This blanket, usually made of beryllium, copper, and steel, heats up so that water in pipes in the blanket start to boil. The steam created in this way can push against the blades of a turbine, causing giant, mag giant magnets to spin. This magnetic field, in turn, pushes against the electrons in the turbine, generating the electricity that eventually winds up in your living room. Okay. So that was that was a lot of Simple. words, but that, that was that was a lot of words. But I was I would encourage you if you're listening to this right now, press pause and go back to when Mark started talking talking about that description because I think it's really interesting to start thinking about the process of this and, and how it comes together. It's you know from a high level, it's 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 pretty understandable. Um, and the challenge is on, on top of that is like in this donut. Uh, I think the analogy was imagine one of those like long balloons that like, you know, uh, people use to like make circus animals. Right. So you blow up that big, long balloon and you wrap it around like it's a donut. Right. And imagine the challenge being trying to create an equal amount of pressure around that balloon. So the plasma inside the balloon can actually have the condition the correct condition long enough for this reaction to happen it's really interesting and it goes back to like holy cow all of these little interdependencies like you push here and here how much data does that generate it's like crazy right so you need something that we don't have uh applied in the proper way yet i think we're getting there and that's quantum computing and and, and really interesting solve for this right have have you heard of the, the i pencil quote no. So when I was reading that, I just kept thinking of this I pencil quote. And it, I've, got the, I've got this quote here. It's, no one person on the planet has all the knowledge or skills necessary to make one pencil. And then they, they go into how many people actually take to make a pencil from nothing to the finished pencil. And like, nobody in the world can do that. And I was reading that. I was thinking, wow. Like the, the, There's the got to be someone the they can make, the, make a pencil. For, from nothing, so it sounds like, like a challenge. Well, there's not one single person. It takes people. It takes a group of people to make a pen. It, it's starting from nothing. Obviously, if you have the lead and you have the wood, then yes, people can do that. But how do you get the lead into the shape? How do you extract the lead from the ground? How do you the whole process from beginning to end? Is I think what it means. But basically, what I'm getting at is that we're rubbish. Like humans <laughs> are rubbish. We're we're useless. And I think. We can't do anything, okay? We've somehow managed to get here to 2024. We've bodged it. We've accidentally found all these solutions to all these things. It's been a complete fluke that we're here. We have a few people like Planck and Einstein who've helped us, but essentially we're rubbish. And I think that quantum computers basically help us to not be so rubbish. That could be, all right. So uh, we're talking to, this is, this is going to you, um, IBM, this is going to you, D-Wave. This is going to you, Horizon <laughs> One. This is going to all of you guys. 
So help the human race not be rubbish. Rubbish brought to you by Quantum. I mean, there's got to be something there, right? There's got to be something there. That's help my, us not that's, be that's, rubbish. That's my pencil drop keynote. Oh my gosh, that was amazing. <laughs> that was amazing. Um, yeah, I guess I, I guess with that, the only thing I, I thought, uh, the last little bit on this one chapter uh, related to the sun and harnessing the power of stars and stuff, uh, the joint European Tauros, JT, uh, I thought this was really interesting. They created a mini star condition for five seconds, meaning they figured out the balance to keep this plasma rolling around the donut for five seconds time, which I'm not sure how much energy that translated to, but that was like a pretty epic um, time to hold that condition because it's really difficult to do, right? Oh yeah, this was great, was it? I love crazy numbers they had some crazy like, i love it when i can feel yeah. the number the, the numbers just kind of crushing my brain yep. um they was where was that number was i want to read it a lot of exponentials a lot of exponentials <laughs> Well, we'll find it. I'll put it in the notes, but yes, it was pretty impressive. Um, yeah. Well, here we go again, you know, piggybacking off of your humans are rubbish. Nature wins again. Stars do this shit naturally. And here we are behind the curve trying to figure the shit out using boxes that we've put together that no longer serve, uh, serve the purpose. And now we need nature's help again to turn our boxes more nature, like more nature, like boxes help us figure out nature. Right. If anyone is watching that as this as well, I'd like maybe someone to come on the show to explain ceramic superconductors at a later date. I'd be Ooh. interested in kind of learning more. That went over my head a little bit. Um, so obviously, well, quantum computers are going to work out how they work. So nobody really knows how they work, do they, or why they work. So that would be nice yeah. if someone could come on and explain that. All right. Shall we move on? Simulating the universe, chapter 16. Chapter 16. So it starts off with a nice little uh, uh, premise of like, I picture like, Galileo used to hold these like sky watching parties. You get like, you get like the, the down low invite from Galileo. Everyone wants to get the invite from him. You know, I've never been to the sky watching party. This guy's doing some shit. Like you finally get the invite to Galileo's sky watching party. Uh, and talking about a lot of the, the scientists who've done really, really amazing thing. You've referenced Planck, Einstein, for like all of these amazing scientists, they've done a really great job. The success of science has resulted in this astronomical ocean of data. And here we are with this problem. Like, are we using all of this data that we collected to its, to its most beneficial form for us? Right. And I don't think we are, but I think there's potential for us to do that, which is really exciting to me. Yeah. Well, I, I think that in this chapter, it's all of the big, questions and challenge of of astrophysics is it's like exoplanets go and find them extraterrestrials we can find them it's, it's about stellar evolution how stars evolves why certain stars ev turn it eventually into black holes why some don't um what's the other side of black holes what's the other side how do they work dark matter string theory these are all of the challenges that uh, micho proposes that quantum will be able to solve with all that data that we have. Well, as if we need any more shit to worry about, you know, they start talking about untracked asteroids. You know, apparently we're tracking like 25,000 yeah. of them. Oh, but PS, there's hundreds of thousands of untracked ones. And you start thinking, okay, well, what's going on there? And then Carrington event, right? You know, back in the 1800s, the solar flare that kind of fired everything out, you know, solar flares can do damage to everything that we do, right? This our if solar flare went off right now, as we're recording, it would uh, totally whack out the uh, the computer systems that are capturing all of this stuff, right? Gamma ray bursts, like holy cow. But you know the the hope of that is in order to predict some of these very complex things, you have to a have the data, but also the wherewithal to figure out the interdependencies and relationships between all of these things. And I think that's again, like I said before, that's what that's where it gets exciting for quantum. What was that near? near earth asteroid that was going to come within oh, 10 percent of a profit within 10 percent of the distance to the moon it says it's going to go under some high earth satellites 
Elon may want to tuck those things down, tuck those things in for for a bit. In uh, what is that? Twenty twenty nine, I think, is what they what, said. One asteroid that is being examined carefully as a threat is Apophis, which is roughly one thousand feet across and will skim the Earth's atmosphere in April twenty twenty nine. It will come within ten percent of the distance between the Earth and the Moon. That sounds pretty close. <laughs> that is pretty damn close. Yeah. yeah. It's very so, good. Like, so quantum computers will be able to track the trajectories of these asteroids, won't it? And give us an early warning system should one be approaching. That. Yeah, and they talked about some some testing, some things that actually have been able to redirect uh, things in motion as well. So maybe there's this this development of, of a, some sort of protection system. Again, we're getting very Star Wars-y. Uh, but I think uh, the the one thing that stood out to me, and this this is a thread I've, I've said probably four times in just this episode, but throughout the other ones as well, is the infinite amount of uh, complex and interdependent data, right, that uh, is swirling around. And again, we're not using it the best we can because we can brute force process it, but we can't analyze the relationships between it when things shift and move and affect each other. Check this out. So this is this is something really interesting to talk about the amount of data that's out there just in the world. So in the Large Hadron Collider, two beams of protons slamming against each other create a trillion bytes per second. That's just two minuscule subatomic particles collecting. So Mark, look around your room and imagine how many subatomic particles are, are colliding in your room. Imagine how many in your house, your state, your country, your hemisphere, the world, the solar system, the universe, like the, just the inordinate amount of interactions that are happening that we could study and analyze. It's mind blowing and traditional compute can't do it. I think you've covered it all there. <laughs> Is that still as many um, atoms interacting as if you put a grain of sand or a grain of rice on a chessboard and then double it for each square and by the end of it, you have more grains of rice than there are... <laughs> interactions in the universe or something yeah grains of sand on the beach are more than the stars in the sky kind of thing yeah um i guess oh the no last... the other one there's more stars in the sky than grains of sand grains on the, of beach, sand, the other way around yeah well, definitely more than there are grains of rice on the beach but yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's just people sloppy people spilling um last little bit here and then we can go in these last two chapters the um actually you know what let's just fire into the last so chapter 17 a day in the year 2050 and it was i thought it was a nice attempt at at a narrative to kind of string together all right you're waking up you're in this world um kaku's brilliant in a lot of ways i think i would have loved a mark fielding narrative uh in this chapter as thank you thank as you Jamie, you yes. would have you would have projected <laughs> this because it was eh, slightly underwhelming but he's not a, he's a brilliant scientist he's not a storyteller right and i think that it's a very good summary because if you read chapter 17 you don't really need to read the rest of the book oh man dropping, <laughs> dropping shortcuts we don't like shortcuts we, we don't, don't like, like shortcuts no exactly sorry that is, goes completely against everything we stand for we don't um, like shortcuts mark only by reading the rest of the book does chapter 17 make sense obviously well, well played um, yeah basically he just outlines all of the scenarios that he theorizes quantum could solve during the book in one chapter he pretends it's the day a day in 2050 and he outlines them you've got personal robots they've solved um fusion they've got they've cured cancer they have yeah he's brushing his teeth or something and then you know the mirror goes hey sorry uh mark but you have cancer um the good news is you can go pick up your prescription at the store and you won't have it tomorrow like that's that's some cool shit like if that really happens how amazing would that be right i mean there's so many people affected with with just cancer alone that's uh that would be amazing if that could turn a corner i i think that in 2050 obviously i i i think he's fallen foul like everybody to the immediacy fallacy whatever it is like you can achieve more in 10 years than you can if i whatever it is basically 2050 is too soon it's mm. not very far away but if some of these things have come true if some of these things are a reality, a reality like the curing cancer like you mentioned early detection systems for um asteroids smashed into the earth some of these that would be good and then we can build on those although maybe i'm completely wrong because maybe it's like a domino rally isn't it and once you get to a point and one of them's been solved then could be they all they all tumble in could one. be so that so that the way the book ends 
is is through this kind of last little piece of quantum puzzles that asks some really interesting existential questions. I think the the time to explore those questions could be a whole book in and of themselves. Um, but the one little nugget that I well, okay, out, then, why don't we leave those questions for our audience? We pose the questions. Ooh, yeah. We, if anyone's still listening to this, think about these questions. Could you just give a a background to these questions, Jeremy? Well, there's there's four. Let's see, there's four that he lists, right? Um, and uh, the first one is, did God have a choice in making the universe? Pretty interesting, right? This is one of the things that you know Einstein wrestled with, right? Um, as as one of the most profound questions that someone could ask. Uh, could it be? Could he? Could could God have created? And I said he. That was dumb. Could God have created the universe in any other way? Right. That's a big question. Number two, is the universe a simulation? That breaks my face every time I like think about it. But it's it's really interesting. I read the book, uh, one of Neil Stevenson's books. Um, what was it called? Uh, the fall of Dodge. I think it was, uh, okay. yeah. Anyway, it was about basically creating, um, you know, creating, uh, representations of your electrical, your brain's electrical currency and turning that into this digital being that becomes born again and all of that kind of stuff. Right. In this simulation that people watch, it was crazy. Um, read the culture novels in and banks. They're my favorite where you can actually choose to go into a simulation to oh to, wow because you know ai has done everything so now you go okay there's no work for me to do i'm gonna go and be this and obviously everyone can live forever so or you, you go into i'm gonna go and do this for a thousand years i'm gonna go do this for a thousand years in some kind of simulation you can choose have, between simulations i might have to read those um let's see leaving the other questions and if, if you have answers to these or you want to riff on these just put it in the comments right and just let's let's have a let's extend this uh discussion far beyond this episode right so the last two do quantum computers compute in a parallel in parallel universes right so this one. is the many worlds theory kind of coming together again uh that we talk about and then is the universe itself a quantum computer there you have it pencil drop Book is done. Professor Kaku, we would love to have you on the show to expand. Uh, we have many questions for you, but I thought I learned a ton about, I, I feel like a little bit more empowered on, on what quantum can actually do and the gaps between what nature does and what we want to do and what we need to do as a society, as a, as a, as a species and what quantum could do to help fill those gaps. I feel more empowered to, to, to understand and think through some of that as we see this great technology develop. Agreed, agreed. And if anyone wants to take it further, go to thinkingonpaper.xyz. We've had some awesome people from the world of quantum computing. We've spoken to them in length on the show from IBM, from D-Wave, from Horizon, from Equal One. We've spoken about quantum software, real world use cases, hybrid computers. And just on my answers to the questions, they are no, no, Yes, maybe. Well played, sir. Well played. <laughs> well, that's a wrap on Quantum Supremacy by Michio Kaku. Stay tuned for our next book. Mark, you got it with you? There Are it is, The Nexus. Another one, Nexus, not The Nexus, just Nexus by Yuval Noah Harari. Yes. And we're actually going to do this, flip this a little different. We're actually going to do these book clubs live. The first one is when, Mark? I th the 22nd of November, two weeks today, 22nd two of November. Today. We're going to go live. You can, we'll pop people in and out. If you're reading the book with us, do it. And uh, we're going to see about uh, kind of spreading our wings a little bit on this one. Keep reading, everybody. Books are the oldest and greatest technology. And without them, what are you? You are just a, a tool of AI. Stay disruptive. Be curious. Keep thinking on paper.